actually, I'm not going to talk any faster, but some of the things I might not quite elaborate on as much. Is that okay? I'll be, I'll be more than happy to answer anybody's questions afterwards. Um, but I just want to at least cover everything. All right. Part two. Ding, ding, ding. Round two, I guess. So I guess this is boxing match goes 15 rounds. I guess we should have taken many more breaks. So, All right. Moving right along. Utilities and inspection. In the GAR contract package in the purchase and sale, it already has pre-printed that the utilities to be turned on and stay on through closing are the responsibility of the seller. In the RE forms, it says the utilities, there is a fill in, the, actually it's not a fill in the blank, there's an option, buyer or seller responsible for turning on the utility. So you negotiate and you think, well gosh, that should be a seller's responsibility. Well, sometimes the utilities are not on. The buyer wants to buy the house. They need to be on for inspections and appraisals, so forth and so on. The buyer's like, fine, no problem. I'll turn them on because I want to be able to move forward with the contract or determine if I am. Uh, inspection. The only thing it says in the GAR contract about inspection, it, has, it says there is a right to inspect the property and a duty to inspect the neighborhood. In the RE forms, it just says duty to inspect. It doesn't specify property or neighborhood. But again, these are all things that a buyer should address when they're making the determination if they're going to terminate the contract or not. Okay, appraisal contingency. So, there is a big difference. You know what, let me do FHA. Well, now we'll do this. If a buyer's getting a conventional loan, okay, and you go binding under the GAR contract, so you go binding under the GAR contract and you have to use the separate conventional loan contingency exhibit. In the RE forms, you go binding under the RE forms purchase and sale agreement for a conventional loan. No other documentation is needed if, as long as you filled that out properly. If the property does not appraise for the contract price, in GAR, the buyer must, the buyer is obligated to give the seller the opportunity to sell it for the appraised price, for the lower price. The buyer must submit that amendment to the seller, giving them the option of selling it for the lower price, prior to whatever number of days you negotiate for the financing contingency, I'm sorry, appraisal contingency. Okay? Now, once the seller receives that amendment saying, will you sell it for the lower price of whatever came across in the appraisal, there are other time frames built in, and it's all spelled out in the purchase and sale. I'm not going to go over them in depth, but there are other time frames. That negotiated time frame under the appraisal contingency, 21 days, 28 days, whatever you guys are negotiating, that is the time frame within which the buyer must submit the seller the amendment to, uh, to negotiate through if they're going to sell it for lower. If the buyer does not submit the amendment to the seller, giving them the option of selling it lower, the buyer is obligated to go through with the purchase and sale agreement for the contract price regardless of the appraisal. They're going to have to bring cash to the table for the difference. Okay? If the buyer has submitted the amendment to the seller and the seller says, no, I'm not going to sell it for the lower price, then the buyer has the option of still buying the house and bringing cash for the difference, or the buyer can terminate and get their earnest money back. Okay? That's GAR. RE form, conventional loan. Appraisal comes in low. You still have that time frame. You still have that negotiated 21 days, 28 days, whatever. The buyer still has to figure out what they're going to do before the end of that appraisal contingency period under conventional. But the appraisal comes in low the buyer has the option of terminating right then and there. So if you're binding under the RE form, appraisal comes in low on conventional loan, you do not have to give the seller the option of selling it lower. You can just terminate, walk, get your earnest money back. The buyer may give the option, this an amendment, uh, to give them the option of selling it lower. But a buyer has termination rights immediately upon low appraisal as long as you do so within the time frame. <coughs> Big difference. It's a pretty one. <laughs> la, la, la. So my husband's ringtone for me 
is when I call, you know how you have special ringtones for your loved ones? So my husband's ringtone for me is like if you're on a submarine and it goes, bah, bah, bah. I'm like, Babelicious, I call him Babelicious. Babelicious, that's not a very flattering ringtone for your wife. He goes, he goes, no, 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 baby Ruth. It's just so I can hear it wherever I am and pick it up. I'm like, yeah, uh huh, right. All right, failure to appraise, FHA loan. Buyer may terminate at their sole discretion. Or either party may propose an amendment to the other to renegotiate. Buyer's termination rights go through day of closing. FHA insured loan, appraisal comes in low, doesn't matter, there's no, on an FHA and a VA insured loan, there is no time frame for an appraisal contingency. It goes through whatever day of closing keeps getting negotiated. On the RE form, buyer may terminate at sole discretion. Either party may propose an amendment to the other. Buyer terminates. Same thing, right? Government, you guys, are government-insured loans take precedence and supersede anything else in your contract. Termination rights for a buyer to terminate without penalty, meaning they get their earnest money back if it doesn't appraise, go through day of closing. Now, the same thing, like I said before, the buyer can't just not show up to closing. The buyer still would need to send a notice of termination to the seller prior to the last day of closing, prior to the, the day of closing, the last time frame of that. But termination rights through day of closing, FHA loan and VA insured loan, same. Same thing with a VA loan, it's the exact same. Termination rights for a buyer with no penalty go through day of closing, or the buyer may propose an amendment to the seller to renegotiate. And so VA and FHA as far as appraisal are the same. There is a big difference, there are a lot of differences in the itemization in the VA loan exhibit on FHA, um, but. The VA loan exhibit on RE forms and the VA loan exhibit on GAR forms. There's a section we know when a buyer is getting a VA insured loan, there are certain costs that the seller is absolutely required and obligated to pay on behalf of the buyer. What those items are are, are outlined in the contracts. The itemized list in GAR is different from the itemized list in VA. Now, there are certain lender overlays, but they go on and on and on. Make sure you look at those on your own when you look at the forms. I've got the, um, so in your packages, not only do you have the purchase and sale agreements, you have the VA loan exhibit, uh, ex VA loan exhibits, the FHA loan exhibits, you've got the temporary occupancy, you've got other forms in your packages. And again, these are referenced in the little handout, that table. You'll see what form and what page or what paragraph number. All right. Time frames for the loan contingency. So remember we just talked about, you guys know, when you're writing an offer and you're negotiating X number of days for financing contingency, appraisal contingency, due diligence, all that kind. That's what I'm talking about, time frames. For the loans... In the GAR contract package, the time frames, buyer, the buyer has X number of days, That's the time frame is on the loan exhibit in and of itself. In the RE forms, the time frame is in where? The purchase and sale. So, for example, our RE form, FHA, buyer getting an FHA loan. The FHA loan exhibit just describes the appraisal part and all the other stuff. But the time frame, the number of days, that is back in the purchase and sale. So the time frames are delineated in different places. All right, delay in closing. Both contracts, anybody can change anything in the contract as long as you have agreement. How do we know we have agreement? Two signatures. How do we know it's two signatures? Two hands, right? Anybody can change anything by agreement on an amendment. Now, in the GAR contract, there is also a provision for an eight-day unilateral extension. What does unilateral mean? What does uni mean? One. That means...
means one, either party can delay the closing for eight days and the other party is held into contract against their will. Why do I say against their will? They don't have to agree. If they were going to agree, how would you extend it? By amendment, right? If they don't agree to an amendment, so you're using this number one as a last case, last ditch effort, right? But in the GAR contract, either party may extend it for eight days. Either party. Now, there are specific reasons. They can't just say, I need more time. I can't schedule movers. There are very specific reasons that are outlined in the contracts and we cover in the other class. I'm not going to cover those right now. In the RE form, you can ex delay a closing by amendment. There's no unilateral right to extend. But there is a provision. We all know the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a new government agency that went into effect for us, how it applies to us, October of 2015. And one of the things that they enacted are what we lovingly refer to as the TRID laws. TRID stands for Truth in Lending, RESPA, Integrated Disclosures. Whole, whole nother <laughs> topic of discussion. Nevertheless, one of the tenets of the TRID laws through CFPB is a lender, it is illegal, federally illegal, a lender is not allowed to close a loan for a buyer if the lender has not sent out certain financial disclosures to the buyer three days prior to closing. So we call those the, the TRID disclosures. That's what we colloquially talk about when, when you're doing a lot of business. So because that is federal law, you, the, the, the buyer just legally would not be able to close because the lender's not going to be able to close them. So the RE forms package addresses, that's the main reason they put this verbiage in there. So it says, if a lender delay, if there's a lender delay, again, not caused by the buyer, and it's typically referring to these trade disclosures not going out, or if through the buyer processing, through the lender processing the loan for the buyer, there are certain additional costs that the seller must pay on behalf of the buyer. That's more than the seller was aware of or agreed to in the contract. Then what has to happen is the buyer must first send notice to the seller. Hey, look, my lender, my lender called. Uh, we can't close. We can't close on March 26th. We have to close on April 8th, April 10th, April 20th. It's not in eight days. It's whatever time frame. The buyer first has to send notice to the seller. It has to be based on a lender reason that the lender can't do it or there's additional co costs imposed to the buyer. Then the seller, upon receiving that notice, they can say, nope, I'm not doing it that long. I terminate. You get your earnest money back. Go on your way. I'm going to go sell it to someone else. Or the seller can say, that's fine, we'll go through and close on whatever date was on that notice. Okay? So it's not unilateral because the seller has the option to terminate. Make sense? No eight-day unilateral on the RE forms. So let me go back just quickly to the situation where we were talking about the counter and switcher, switcheroo forms. If the buyer presents an offer on the RE form, we just learned there's no eight-day unilateral right to extend in the, in the body of the RE form purchase and sale. Now, let's say the seller counters, but instead of rewriting it on the GAR form, if they rewrite everything on the whole GAR purchase and sale, now we do have an eight-day unilateral right to extend. If all they do is use the GAR one-page counteroffer form and just counter sale price, closing costs, closing date and possession, and that's all they counter, send it to the buyer, buyer signs it, sends it back, we're binding. Is there an eight-day unilateral right to extend or not? No. no, because the rest of the terms of the purchase and sale go back to the original offer, and the original offer was on what form? RE. Okay, so it's, it's, it's only if they rewrite the whole thing on the whole purchase and sale. Make sense? So the GAR form with the unilateral extension... <coughs> Oh, close within eight days. No, 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 no. You have to send notice. You guys, you can't just do stuff. They, agree to that they don't have to agree. Notice takes how many signatures? One. One. That's why the other party is held into the contract against their will. The, but you have, 
to do it, the buyer ha or a seller, either party can do it, they have to send that notice of the eight-day unilateral extension prior to the contract closing date. So if we're scheduled to close March 26th, the party would have to send that eight-day notice. They, they don't need the other party's signature. They can sign it that we're, we're extending it for eight days, but it has to be sent before 1159 p.m. on March 26th. The RE, there's no unilateral right to extend. Uh, if it's, it has to be, they have to right. send the notice. So if you send the notice. Yes, the seller can say, nope, not doing it. We're done. That's the only difference. Well, there's no unilateral right. It's not, in the GAR contract, the seller doesn't have a choice. They have to stay in it for eight days. Right. In the RE, if they send the notice, if there is a lender delay or post cost, it's not eight days. I can, I can extend it for 20 days. Now, at that point, you could, would probably end up now amending it, but. Is there a counter or for in the RE package? Yeah. Okay, I Just a, yep, yes, there is. All right. <laughs> Damage to property prior to closing. Buyer or seller may terminate. So this is if the property is substantially damaged, typically by weather, major vandalism, something like that, which y'all be careful. There's lots of weather going on. Um, <laughs> buyer or seller may terminate. If there's no termination, the seller has one year to restore the property, and then after it's restored, you have to, you have to close either within a year or if it's restored prior to the end of a year, within seven days of getting the notice. In the RE form, if you get notice that there's substantial damage to the property, the buyer may terminate or the buyer can say, no problem, I'm going on with the property, but you assign me all your insurance proceeds. All right, closing attorney. This was a question earlier. In the GAR contract, it says the buyer chooses the closing attorney. And if there, who does the attorney represent? The lender. So if there's no lender, the, in the GAR contract, it states the closing attorney represents the buyer. I'm going to get to that in a second. In the RE forms, the, it has a place, buyer or seller, to choose closing attorney. And there's no verbiage about lender involvement. That's all, if, if, you know, if, there's no, if it's an all-cash deal, there's no other verbiage. It just says buyer or seller to choose. Now, in the GAR contract, if there's no lender, if there's a lender, the closing attorney represents the lender. If there's no lender, the GAR contract says the, 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 bleh, the closing attorney represents the buyer. You guys, for your buyers, they don't have legal representation if there's a dispute. It's not like they went out and hired an attorney, paid him a, a retainer fee to represent them in a dispute in the contract. When there is a lender, how, what, do we, what does the closing attorney get from the lender? No, well, yeah, but no. They get, they get the closing package, right? What is that package? Yes, it's a set of instructions to the closing attorney directing them how to prepare all that paperwork, okay? So if there's no lender involved, these poor closing attorneys, they don't know what to do. Where do they get their instructions from? Well, the contract tells them, since you're not getting the package from a lender directing you how to prepare the closing documents, you are now instructed to prepare the closing do documents with respect to the buyer's position in this contract. That's all GAR means when it says, if there's no lender involved, the closing attorney shall represent the buyer. It's just telling the closing attorney how to prepare the the documents. It's not legal representation if there's a dispute in the purchase and sale. Uh, and all it says is buyer or seller choose the closing attorney. There's no verbiage about how representation. Does the, how does the attorney know instructions? They're going to just go through the contract, which is mostly what they do anyway, you guys, really. All right. Um, closing attorney. Oh, I just did that. All right. Oh, this is the one thing. I shake my head at RE. My, my, my. Why did they use the term accepted? So for a binding contract, we've already talked about what a binding agreement is, right? It's notice of acceptance. In the GAR contract, they use the word binding. In the RE forms contract, they use the word accepted. So when you are on an RE forms contract and it says accepted contract, it connotes a binding contract. It means notice of acceptance. I hate, hate, 
hate that they use that word because truly an accepted contract is different from it being binding upon the parties. And they use it to mean binding. I just hate that they use that word because it gets confusing. Now, okay. You guys, we get discussions. I'm not going to say fights, but we get in discussions all the time. We get discrepancies over the binding agreement date. The binding agreement date, we, we already addressed this earlier in the, in the course. The binding agreement date can be determined beyond the shadow of a doubt by using the definition, which is notice of acceptance, and by using the terms of notice, right? We had a really, really good discussion about that at the beginning of class. So it doesn't matter who there shouldn't be a discrepancy over the binding agreement date. So let's say that one agent fills it in. Uh, let's say you go binding on a, uh, let's say you get it and the parties all sign it on Friday, but the agent doesn't send it back to the other agent until Saturday. But the agent fills in Friday's date, sends it back Saturday. What's the binding agreement date of the contract? Saturday. Saturday. Does it matter that it has Friday's date on there? No. The binding agreement date can be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt based on the definition of binding agreement date and the terms of notice in the contract. Okay, but the problem is we have one side that thinks it's on Friday. We have another side that thinks it's on, day, on Saturday. We're a day off when they come to terminate on due diligence. So you guys need to get that squared away right then and there. Why everybody's still happy, right? Everybody's happy at that time. You need to get it squared away right then and there, either with a form or with an amendment. But it doesn't matter. It, there's, there's no discussion about it. There's no dispute about it. Based on the definition and notice, we can determine when the binding agreement date is. All right. Survival of closing. This is really important. Survival of closing basically means that the buyer's and the seller's responsibilities with respect to to whatever it is exists. They're still responsible for that even after the closing date if it is something that survives closing. Okay? If it doesn't survive closing, as soon as you close, there's no more responsibility for that. So in the GAR contract, these are the things that are that specifically survive closing. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Commission. Yay! Yay! Title, meaning the, the seller's warranty of the title, warrant, any warranties of the seller, any obligation the parties agree shall survive closing. Seller's interest in warranty service contracts uh, at a buyer's ex acceptance and expense, and the condemnation of a property. So I have this note for you guys. This provision shall survive closing. Anywhere in there, do you see the term home warranty? Anywhere in there, do you see repairs? No. no. So if you have a buyer and a seller that on a purchase and sale agreement negotiate that the seller will pay for a one-year home warranty for the buyer uh, not to exceed $495, da 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 and you get to closing, you're binding on GAR. And you get to closing, you close, change keys, blah, 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 everybody goes away. A couple days later, buyer calls you and says, hey, I need that information about that home warranty. And you're like, hmm, let me call the listing agent. I completely forgot about it. You call the listing agent and you say, gosh, remember that home warranty? And the listing agent says, gosh, we forgot to call it in. Well, it was in the contract, so you need to go ahead and call it in and get the seller to pay for it now. And the listing agent says, so sad, too bad, that does not survive closing. And then the buyer's agent says, yes, but I took Dana's class. And so when I wrote that in the purchase and sale agreement, it is a special stipulation seller to provide one-year home warranty to cost not to exceed $4.95. And I wrote Dana's magic phrase, this provision shall survive closing. That means that, yes, the seller is still obligated to, buy, to pay for it. So either you can pay for it or your seller can pay for it. Let me know the, the uh, confirmation number when you get it. Right? That's an example of what I mean. This really is important for stuff. In the RE forms contract, there it says under the survival clause, the provisions of this contract survive closing. What does that mean? The whole, everything they agreed to do survives closing. All right. 
condition of property at closing. Gar says substantially same condition. Gar says clean and free of trash and debris. Huh? Clean and free of trash and debris. And they added this year, 2019, and personal property of the seller not identified as remaining with the property. In the RE forms contract, when it's talking about the condition of property at closing, it says same condition, normal wear and tear accepted. In this situation, the GAR verbiage is much better for a buyer. There was a, uh, my understanding is there was a lawsuit here several years ago. GAR used to have this verbiage, normal wear and tear accept, same condition, normal wear and tear accepted. GAR has changed it to substantially same condition. Um, there was a buyer buying a 20-year-old house, and it was in the summertime, and when they bought the house, the HVAC was working just fine. They went and did their final walkthrough, and guess what was not working? The air conditioner was not working. They go to closing, and buyer says, the, uh, the air conditioning is not closing. And the seller says, anyway, it didn't close. It went to court. The judge, so this is now in court, and the, seller, the buyer says, look, I bought a house with the air conditioning working. The seller says, you bought a house with the air conditioner working, but what you agreed to is at closing, the property would be in the same condition, normal wear and tear accepted. It's a 20-year-old HVAC. Guess what's normal for a 20-year-old HVAC? To poop out at about 20 years. Guess who won that case? The seller. Gar then changed the verbiage to breed substantially same condition. So a non-working air conditioning unit, is that substantially the same condition as a working no. air conditioning? No. That's the difference in those, ver those terms. So could you add that verbiage into special steps if you do that when you're presenting on the RE? Uh, it depends what side you're on. If you're on the well, seller side, side. If you're on the buyer side, then what I would do is reference that paragraph and say, per, and I don't have it in front of me, per paragraph, whatever, uh, Property shall be, yes, property shall be in substantial, at closing, special, uh, at closing, property be in substantially same condition as it was upon binding. Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you're on the buyer side. If you're on the seller side, you want normal wear and tear. Just saying. All right. Repairs. GAR references repairs, and it says good and workmanlike manner, and they need to be completed prior to closing. In the RE forms contract, it says good and workmanlike manner, and they need to be completed three days prior to closing. There's no verbiage in either contract about a buyer's termination rights if the seller doesn't complete the repairs. You guys, if a seller, you, you negotiated for repairs, you do a final walkthrough, the seller hasn't done them. It's not automatic termination rights for the buyer without penalty. This is a whole nother long topic of discussion that I'm not going to address right now because we have other things to cover. There's no survival language in the GAR contract. When you're negotiating for repairs, in other words, on the amendment to address concerns, when you're at that point during a buyer's due diligence to figure out, now I'm going to cover those amendments in a second, when you're negotiating for the seller to do something, you have got to put in verbiage right then and there. Again, we're still all happy right now. Well, we start to get a little upset because they're asking us to fix stuff and do money and all that stuff, but we're still relatively happy. You've got to address potential consequences if the seller doesn't do the repairs. Either build in buyer termination rights if the seller doesn't do them, or build in a way for the seller to pay for those at closing. Would you guys like for me to send you the special stipulation written by a closing attorney to address that, either one of those situations? Okay, if I can read your email addresses, let me give you all a hint. If y'all want, because what they, everybody asks for your email address all the time, right? We get so much junk mail, and you really don't want your junk mail in your business mail, right? You guys, there's so many free emails, right? Through Gmail, Yahoo. You guys, come up with some email somewhere so that you can write it when people ask you for emails that you don't really want to monitor. But then when you know you're going to get something good, you can go back and monitor <laughs> instead of making, I'm just saying. Okay, <laughs> moving along. All right, seller's property disclosure form. And there is a copy of this in your handouts, too. In the GAR contract package form, it has all these things for a buyer and a, for a seller to indicate yes or no. It, 
um, there's no I don't know provision. They took that out a few years ago. And there is no year for systems or age except for the, when the HVAC was involved. Was it installed? And, sorry, and it has a seller, the last page of that has a whole list of all these potential personal property items. And it says what the seller's leaving with the property and what the seller's taking with them. Okay, that's the GAR seller's property disclosure form. In the RE seller's disclosure form, there is an option for unknown. So the seller can say yes, no, or unknown, meaning I don't know. It does have a year when the systems were installed and if there's material defects. There is nothing regarding fixtures and items that stay or go with the property. There is a whole, a whole bunch of stuff that talks about refrigerator, um, and it looks like personal property items. And all the seller indicates is if there is a material defect with that item. Now, the reason the RE forms has it like that is on the purchase and sale agreement in the RE form, so turn in handout three of three, on page one, And it talks about property description. So you give the address, the legal description. I'm on the very first paragraph. Paragraph 1, page 1. Together with all permits, privileges, rights, members, appurtenances there too, and together with all improvements, fixtures, personal property, trees, timber, and other crops and plants located thereon. That's what the seller is agreeing to sell. Now, it doesn't mean the bedroom set. It doesn't mean the couch right? But it does mean the refrigerator, the stove, so forth and so on. In the RE form. Because that's why in the seller's property disclosure form in the RE form, it says refrigerator. Is it in good working order? Are there any material defects? So if a seller is going to take their sub-zero fridge from the kitchen with them, you guys need to address that in the purchase and sale agreement or with a bill of sale. I'm just reading you guys what's in the con That's why you guys are in this class, right? Hello. Right. Now, again, there is in Georgia a common law of fixtures. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not about to talk about that law. But that's a big difference in the seller's um, disclosure form between the two contracts. All right. Community Association Exhibit. You guys, this is substantially the same information in both GAR and RE. We have a huge issue right now with homeowners associations and the fees that they are charging for buyers, especially at closing, right? And it's not necessarily your HOAs. It's more of the management companies. And anyway, it, it's just, it's just uh, an issue. It seems to be an issue. So in the GAR Community Association Disclose Exhibit, it does say... Um, and actually, there is an update. I should have updated it. But it does have undisclosed fees or increases in fees to be paid by the seller at closing. So if a seller is filling out the Community Association Disclosure Exhibit and they don't put in anything about initiation fee or transfer fee for the buyer, they leave that blank or they put in an amount that's too low, and you get to closing, and the closing attorney gets information what those fees are, guess who has to pay them at closing, even though they're, buyer, they're for the buyer's benefit? Seller. The seller. Now, that verbiage is in your handout. Uh, they've just changed it in 2019. So it's in uh, Form F322 is the Community Association Form. It's in two paragraphs now. It used to just, just be in Paragraph 5. It's now also in Paragraph 4A. So they've added it to that separate paragraph. In the RE Forms contract package, it is substantially the same thing. If any changes in fees 
The only difference is if uh, the seller has three days to disclose to the buyer any changes in fees. Any initial fees not disclosed or changes in fees not disclosed, again, the seller has to pay for them at closing. So substantially, it's the same thing. So listing agents, you all have got to get your sellers to find out what those fees are or they're going to end up paying them at closing even though they're for the buyer benefit. All right. Amendment during buyer's right to terminate. So this is uh, also the due diligence. Whoo, I got 15 minutes. Okay. Blah. Okay. I'm going to show you where this is in these forms. So this is, so when a buyer is in their due diligence or their option time frame and they're trying to decide if they're going to go through with the, with the contract or terminate, the buyer can have an inspection done or whatever, and they can come to the seller and they can say, you know, I found a couple things that are going to help me with my decision if I'm going to terminate this option or go through with it. So I want you to address these certain concerns. So you do an amendment. The buyer uh, initiates an amendment to the seller saying, I want you to address these concerns. And then the buyer and the seller negotiate through those items, and then the buyer decides if they're going to terminate or not terminate. So the two forms, however, are vastly different. Where is it? I'm missing it. In the, oh man, did I not include it? I know I included it. Shoot. In the RE forms, maybe I just have it stapled out of order. Is it 33? Where are you? I, in the RE forms package, it's on page 33. Shoot, I think I have it missing from your GAR. If anybody finds it, let me know. I'm looking for the amendment uh, to address concerns, if y'all see it. And I'm missing it. You are? Yep. I'm missing it in the guard package, so you just have to pay attention. <laughs> okay, in the RE forms package, at the bottom, it has a little, a little thing, and it has a shall or shall not. In the GAR contract package, I apologize, it is missing from your handout. There is also a little paragraph, and it has a checkbox, shall or shall not. They ref and then the rest of the fill in the blank is, uh, you know, seller to... Uh, fix the, the wood that's gotten rotten because it's water damage, blah, 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 or repay, replace the roof, so forth and so on. The shall or shall not is what is the big difference between the two sets of forms. In the RE forms contract, basically it says that if a buyer sends an amendment to the seller to, to address all these concerns and the seller does not agree to all of this stuff before the end of the buyer's due diligence period, if you mark shall, it means it terminates the contract. So you're only going to mark shall if it's make it or break it issues. It needs a new roof. It needs a structural, the structural foundation is crumbling. And the seller needs to address that. You probably aren't going to use that for a buyer if it just needs to replace some rotten wood or reverse the polarity in an outlet, right? They're still going to want to go through with the contract. It would just be nice if the seller paid for it, but not enough to terminate. So the shall or shall not box in the RE forms amendment terminates the contract. It's there for protection for the buyer if it is truly a make it or break it issue and you don't hear back from the seller before the end of your due diligence period, Okay. In the GAR amendment, that I apologize is missing from your handout, it has a shall or shall not box. But what that one says is if, this, if the buyer pr proposes this amendment to the seller, and if the shall is marked and you get it back from the seller, the seller agrees to do all that stuff, it terminates the due diligence period. So if you had negotiated for a 10-day due diligence period and you send this amendment to the seller on day five and the seller agrees and you had shall marked, your due diligence is done on day five, regardless of the purchase and sale. So it, it, it looks similar because it has shall or shall not, but once we're referring to a termination of the contract, the other one ends the due diligence period. Okay? Okay. Um, now, the due diligence period, you guys, that is a drop-dead date. So let's say we had 10 days from the binding agreement period for the option for the buyer to terminate or go through with it. The rest of the contract says um, if the buyer goes through with it, they're agreeing to buy it as is unless something is changed by amendment. 
Just because you are in the process of negotiating an amendment to address concerns, that does not, the due diligence period is still a drop dead deadline. So if the buyer has an amendment out to the seller, saying, I need you to do this, this, and this, and our due diligence ends tonight at 11.59 p.m. tonight, and you haven't gotten that back from the seller, guess what the buyer has just done the next day? They bought the house as is, right? And at that point, there is absolutely no incentive for the seller to sign it because the buyer can't terminate without defaulting. Make sense? Now, the, another thing to think about, if the buyers presented the seller with an amendment to address concerns and the, seller, the buyer said, okay, seller, I want you to do A, B, C, and D, and the seller presents a counter amendment, doesn't sign that amendment, but sends back another amendment saying, look, I'll do A and B, but I'm not doing C and D, right? So the seller has sent a counter amendment or another amendment back to the buyer still regarding those concerns. We're the last day of due diligence. 11.59 p.m. comes and goes, the buyer did not terminate. So the buyer is still staying in the contract. The buyer now signs that amendment and sends it back to the seller. Is the seller obligated to do those repair items, yes or no? no. Why not? Due diligence has nothing to do with an amendment. Due diligence was only what? Termination. Right, the buyer didn't terminate. But this, there's no, the due diligence time frame is not a time frame on any amendment. The seller had an open amendment to the buyer. The buyer signed it, sent notice of acceptance back. Just like any amendment, it's now what? Binding upon the parties. The seller has to perform. Right? That due diligence period, it's an incentive issue for a seller to sign or not sign. But if you, listing agents, if you're negotiating through repairs, and if you're a listing agent and the seller has sent an amendment back to a buyer and we're coming up to the end of due diligence, what should the seller do if they don't want to do those repairs? No, a seller can't terminate. Due diligence is only a buyer termination. You, the seller has the open amendment back. It's open amendment at, to the buyer. They've already signed it. Now it's in the ball, buyer's ball, ball game. Come on, you guys. We talked about it with the purchase and sale. We talked about it when we had multiple offers over here. Yes. You listening agents, withdraw that last counter offer. Redraw, withdraw that amendment. Then it's no longer on the table. But it's just like any, any amendment, right? There, for whatever reason, okay, I see some heads going poof. You guys, with your amendments, unless it is withdrawn by the party that offered it or unless you specifically add a time limit in there, I don't know why either forms committee doesn't have a time limit in there, it's still open for acceptance. And if it's accepted and notice of acceptance is sent back, it's binding upon the parties. That due diligence time frame is only a time frame for the buyer to terminate or not terminate, period, end of story. So the buyer should put in a time frame? No, the seller should. You guys, the buyer, if the, if the buyer puts, in a, if the buyer wants the seller to do some repairs, absolutely don't put a time frame. The seller can still agree to do repairs even after the, the due diligence time well, frame. What if they don't agree and then you've missed your... Well, the buyer then needs to terminate. The buy, if, you, if you are a buyer and you have sent an amendment to a seller to address repairs and you, you are not getting it back, you need to assume that they're not going to do it. Then at that point, you need to make a decision. Am I going to terminate this contract or do I agree to buy it as is? If we go past this deadline, I'm buying it as is. Oh, guess what? The seller agreed to do it anyway. Great. I, w I, ha I had agreed to buy it as is, but now I get the icing on the cake that the seller is going to do these things anyway. So for a buyer, no, absolutely don't put a time frame on it. But what if you're at the end, the last day? Then you just terminate or go through. Right. You give them the option. If, they, if you don't get it back, they're not paying. You have to go through assuming you're not paying. If you can't afford the house, like if it's a roof, you absolutely need to terminate. If it's a, if it's a reverse polarity, they probably aren't going to want to terminate. 
But if you're a seller, so for a buyer, y'all see, it doesn't it doesn't matter. The, the buyer needs to decide, am I, buy, am I agreeing to buy it as is or not and pay for whatever repairs myself? If it's a make it or break it issue, you absolutely need to terminate for them. But you sellers, you listing agents, that due diligence time frame is just a buyer time frame to terminate. It has nothing to do with the time frame for those repairs. So if the seller has done a counter amendment back to the buyer saying, yeah, I'll fix, I'll reverse that polarity, I'll replace this rotten wood, I'll paint that, I'll replace this, this, and this, and you have it to the buyer, and we go past due diligence, the buyer didn't terminate, and the buyer now sends it back, you're obligated to do that, right? Just something to think about. Okay. <sighs> I think that was important though. Okay, temporary occupancy. If the seller is going to stay in the property after closing, in the GAR temporary occupancy agreement, there is no place in there for the seller to pay the buyer any kind of usage fee or rent fee. They're just being a nice person and letting them stay in there. The only fill in the blank for fee, for, fill in the blank for fee is if the um, Seller doesn't get out when they say they're going to get out. In the RE form, there is a usage fee. So if you're representing a buyer and you fill out a temporary occupancy on the RE form, it does say the seller, since you're staying in my house now for four days, five days, three days, I want you to pay me X amount of dollars per day. That's a provision in the RE version of the form, but not in the GAR version. All right, where am I? Am I at the end? Okay. Oh, I still have, oh, I don't have time. Sorry. Let me address that with you after class. Oh, is that okay? Okay, let me just talk about two more quick things and then we'll be done. And I apologize, I know I'm a little bit over time, but gosh, it's so much. I think it's so important. So, um, closing attorney as holder of the earnest money. We even talked about at the beginning, there's no place in the contracts that your closing attorney signs, right? So, on the GAR forms package, they now have two forms. It's GAR 510, F510 and 511. 510 is what a buyer and a seller agree to if they agree to have a closing attorney as the holder of the earnest money then they identify the closing attorney and all the other stuff is in there so they can go binding with that then the buyer has two business days to get the contract to the closing attorney and the closing attorney has three business days after that to sign it and the earnest money must be wired. That's the only way a closing attorney can be holder of the earnest money. It says in the form it must be wired. That's a new provision, 2019. In those forms, it says that the closing attorney agrees to fulfill all the responsibilities as the holder of the earnest money, make the deposit, resolve disputes, so forth and so on. In the RE forms contract package, there are no forms like this, and we already said there's nowhere in the purchase and sale agreement where a closing attorney signs. So if you go binding under the RE forms contract package, and for whatever reason the parties want to have a closing attorney as the holder of the earnest money, the buyers are giving the attorney thousands and thousands of dollars. Here's Simone. Here's $5,000. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Now, your closing attorneys can't abscond with the money, and they can't do anything illegal with it, but they don't have to fulfill any of those responsibilities that you guys are so familiar with as the holder of the earnest money. Do the 10-day letter, make the deposit, send notice they never got it, so forth and so on. So it's just something to be aware of as a difference. What about if the broker's holding it? The brokers are holding it. When you sign, the brokers are agreeing to fulfill those responsibilities. It's just for closing attorney holding it. Yep. Okay. Um, this, is, this, this really is the last thing. Remedy for default. This changed in GAR in August of last year, August of 2018. Basically, what this says, if you're binding under the GAR contract package and the buyer defaults on the contract, okay, terminates without any condition, they default on the contract, the seller's sole remedy is the earnest money. They can't sue them, period, end of story. They can get their earnest money and that's it. That changed in August of 2018. 
They can't sue for breach. They can't sue for any losses incurred. They can't, they can't sue them. They can get the earnest money or nothing. Well, they get the earnest money, okay? In the guard contract package, um, if, a, if a seller defaults, so the seller terminates the contract by default, the buyer can either terminate and get their earnest money back or the buyer can sue, but the buyer may only sue for specific performance, meaning a, a court would force the seller to sign the deed over to the buyer. They can't sue for damages. They can't sue for rent incurred. They can't sue for legal fees. They can't sue for a holdover. They can't sue for anything else, just specific performance. Again, that's brand new in GAR as of August of 2018, based on a lawsuit that was here in GAR. Now, on the RE forms, if a buyer defaults, a buyer's default under any of the terms of the contract may result in the seller's termination of the contract together with the seller's exercise of all rights and remedies available under the law. So on the RE forms contract, if the buyer defaults, the seller may sue the buyer for damages, um, specific performance, damages, so forth and so on, or accept the earnest money. It's one or the other, which is what we're used to thinking about in GAR, but it's not that way anymore. In the RE forms contract, if the seller defaults, same thing. They have, they have legal rights to sue. Okay? Big difference in the contracts. Now, I will tell you again, I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, but that lawsuit was here in Georgia. So even if the party's combining under the RE forms where it does have uh, legal rights to sue the other party for default, Right now, uh, now again, I'm not a lawyer, but I would think that that case is going to weigh heavily in the judgment of the judge, and they might go with the other thing. But anyway, all right. Okay, GAR contract is designed to protect whom? Buyer. RE Forms contract is designed to protect whom? This is a trick question. Both contracts, you guys... No. You guys, these contracts are completely designed to protect you guys. There is so much verbiage in them about license law. Remember the, fir the first eight things we talked about at the very beginning of class way back then? It seems like it was years ago. <laughs> you can have a contract written by an attorney. You can have a contract on HUD. You can have a new builder's contract. You can have a Fannie Mae. You can have any contract that contains all of those elements and is completely enforceable between the buyer and the seller to convey property, right? But a lot of those other contracts are missing a ton of verbiage that protects you and your license with respect to license law. For example, you have to have your license number on there. You have to have your firm's license number on there. You have to have a, a disclosure of the agency relationships between your broker and the parties. A lot, that, those are just two of a gazillion examples from license law. All that verbiage is contained in the GAR and the RE forms packages, but isn't necessarily in other contracts. So although you can have an enforceable, valid, non-voidable contract between the parties, it doesn't necessarily protect you. There's verbiage in both GAR and RE to protect you and your license. <sighs> we made it. What do y'all think? Hey. Pretty good. So, if y'all want me to email you this PowerPoint presentation, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Have a fabulous